Okay, so so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna just restart for the purposes of the recording. Harnessing Bahamian news, social media, and culture, and audience building. Most of you know me already, and uh, let's begin. What is an audience? A number of people or a particular group of people who have gathered to watch or listen to something, a play, concert, someone speaking, etc. And with this presentation, if you have a comment, if you have a question, you are free to to uh, actually make that comment or ask that question. All right, so here, if you don't think about who's your audience, you are not planning for success. You are hoping for success. And I think that is that is a very important thing because uh, sometimes we get in the habit of, of creating a film and we're hoping that it does well. We're not thinking about who we're actually speaking to. It's like, uh, you know, being in a room full of people and saying, hey, you, you know, sometimes um, someone or people may not even look at you because you can't be speaking to them. You know, when you're speaking to somebody, it kind of carries a personal touch. And um, when you are creating a film, it carries on that same concept. So you want something personal towards that person that tells them that you're speaking to them and you're speaking to them in a way that attracts them to listen. So let's talk about defining your demographics. Defining the demographic of your audience. We are talking about age, gender, geographic, location, ethnicity. So in the, in the Bahamas, um, when we start talking about being an archipelago, we start talking about each island having its different characteristics, having a different, uh, having different ways of doing things. We know Abaco has different ways of doing things in Crooked Island. We know Andrews has different ways of doing things than, than uh, Cat Island. They have different delicacies. They have different ways of making food. Um, sometimes when you get a group of islanders in a room, they you can kind of tell what persons are are good at and you can kind of say you know what i think this person is from Acklands because they're good at business and i think this person in you know long island here they're good at maybe farming this person here in eleuthera might be good at boating and so on and so forth you know the the, the geographic location of each island gives give personal um characteristics to the character um, and also to your audience. Your audience may appreciate different things based on where they're from. Also, the age and the gender is going to be um, deciding factors in terms of who you're speaking to as well. Um, so, you know, war, war movies might appeal more to, to, to young men and to older men. Um, cowboy movies may appeal more to older men. And... Um, and you know more of the series where through romantic comedies may appeal more to to young women than than men so who are we speaking to is going to be very important so defining that you can you can do that a couple ways but the standard way here you can have is uh let's say for example 25 to 35 year old black bohemian man from exuma island and then you can add on more information depending on your project, like, you know, are you speaking to hotel workers, are you speaking to civil servants, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no such thing as a film or theater production that appeals to everyone. So that's important to note as well, because you don't want to try to speak to everyone. Um, when you do that, you lose the personal touch. And we, especially in this market, cannot afford to lose a personal touch. I, I feel it strongly that in order for us to become successful, whether it's in theater, whether it's in film, we have to begin speaking to the Bahamian people in a way that resonates. I am looking forward to the day where there are groups of people that can remember productions and bring up productions almost as in pop culture, almost as in how they speak to each other. So um, just how you would say, hey, you remember that that scene from the Titanic where, you know, Jack goes running after Rose and they come running together. So people remember that. 
but I'm looking toward the day when we have memorable moments in our films and those memorable moments they're going to speak to everybody in different ways and most likely they're going to speak to your niche in the strongest way so you want to be able to target a certain group of people when you're thinking about story so what I'm going to advise is to niche down what I mean by niche down is you want to pick a certain group of people that you know this film speaks to or this theater production speaks to you want to you want to make sure that you're targeting a demographic how does that help you what that does is it removes market competition how do I mean that it removes market competition so let's say for instance you have a film about Kong salad Kong salad uh, you know two Kong salad chefs going at it and uh, they end up falling in love now you're not gonna get that movie anywhere else in the world most likely you're not gonna get it because the story themes are so niche that you know if persons are in your audience that look like they want to see something surrounding bohemian culinary dishes and they want to see something about something universal like love and competition they're going to go to your film first because they know they're not going to find it anywhere else so what you end up doing is creating a blue water system what do i mean by blue water there's no blood in the water there isn't there isn't any big sharks to worry about uh taking up your your screen time now a red water situation is you trying to make something like golden eye or you know a, a james bond film where the american market has that on lock and they have the budgets to completely crush you so you try to create you try to create something like their like them and they got 20 million of those in the market and they're probably going to do it better than you because they've been doing it better for a long time and you can go and take your shot but just know that there's blood in the water now when you niche down and you use and you niche down using the bohemian themes you can find yourself in a very comfortable position so this also ensures a loyal built-in audience so there are people in this country that love certain things that's like junkanoo you're not going to come you're not going to find uh I, I don't know if you're going to find a more loyal audience than junkanooers so imagine appealing to that audience you can imagine the dividends that comes from appealing to that audience and then of course look at ease of marketing you're looking at if you're working on that junk film once you tell one group and let's say one of the groups are featured as the primary protagonist is in that group imagine persons now carrying the word out to all of their their people to be in this movie or to watch this movie so what you ended up doing is you ended up cutting your budget maybe you probably cut your budget in half in terms of marketing and pnr all right so how do you create how do you use your niche to to do some of the work for you 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 find established entities that are proud of their existence proud of their heritage um they 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 have a self-existing sort of audience they're already there and they they get bigger and better because they are an entity to themselves like the boating people the junk canoers um, you have certain people like in the track, track and field, um, you're getting basketball starting to get up there. So you have to think about what groups can I, can my story partner with that is going to help um, push this story along because they feel like the story is so important to who they are. So when you're niching down, you're thinking about recognizable story structure. Sometimes if you're taking on a niche, um, it's going to be easily recognizable. Um, so if you're taking on a story with the uh, Kong Salad Chefs and they're going at it, you would have seen something similar. Um, but what you would have done, because the niche is a uh, Bahamian niche, it's going to allow you to recognize that. You've seen it before. The Koreans do it beautifully. Um, the Americans do it well. The Indians do it well. But now you're putting your your bohemian niche on that and now it looks like something you can digest and it's something that you you recognize so what i always tell persons if i stripped off the coca-cola 
tag off of a Coca-Cola bottle and it was just completely clear, but the Coca-Cola in it was great. How many people are going to actually drink that Coca-Cola out of that bottle? People won't trust it. People will think that's maybe uh, oil. People may think it may be anything. They're not going to trust that. You know, even the cap may be sealed, but they're not going to drink that. But the the fact is that now when you put that, that tag around it, it's recognizable. And now you trust what's in the bottle. And so creating, you know, getting the story structure that people can recognize. And then now you put you put something else. So the Bahamian content is in there. It's good, but nobody wants to drink it. Now you create a story structure. That's the tag of the Coca-Cola. You put that on that bottle, and that's going to allow people to trust trying to, you know, buy this movie on um, Amazon or, you know, viewing it on Netflix. They, they say, look, this thing works. We've seen it work, but now it's within the structure um, under this niche. So you know what? We'll give it a shot. And I think that's one of the great ways or uh, uh, an approach we can take when it comes to audience. Oh, I have here noted as well, you want to make sure your audience is big enough to sustain your product. So you don't want to niche down too much. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you don't want to make a movie about people who love pencils if you're not sure there's a big enough market out there to sustain your product. You may have maybe two or three persons end up, you know, at your showing who love pencils. They just really love pencils. They collect all the pencils and they collect all of the numbers of the pencils and you may only find about two in the Bahamas. You know, you may can, if you had regional distribution, maybe you can get a worldwide uh, release and maybe you find maybe about 100 or 200 people who really love pencils. but you want to be sure that at least there's a there's a built-in audience big enough to sustain your product um, who's purchasing buying your merchandise etc cetera, etc cetera. so i have here cultural anthropology is more defined than simply psychology marilyn howard i was i was uh, very honored to be in in one of her classes and uh, she she talked about really understanding the people in a in a in a place more than just the psychology between humans because the psychology between humans it does not it does not create as much of a connection as the shared experiences of people so i feel like this quote is 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 very important to what we're going to be discussing next so what is bahamian culture so what I'm going to do, I want you to open your mics. I want you to let me know what do you think Bahamian culture is. You can open your mic. What is Bahamian culture? Hi, good evening. Indira Green here. Um, I'm happy to answer this because this is a, a question. Sorry, that go I again? Frequently... Can you hear me? Hello, hello. For some reason, I'm not. For some reason, I'm not able to hear you, Indira. Is there I think I know why. Sense? Okay, wait one second. Okay. Um, my my audio is going to the TV. <laughs> okay. Okay, Indira, you can speak. Yes. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello. Can you oh, hear I me got now? You. I got you. I got you. Thank you. Good. All um, right. So, um. I, I I started to say that I like the question. It's a question that I frequently engage in with colleagues and friends because I think it's an important one. And I think it's important for us to differentiate us and our culture from other cultures. Mm -hmm. When I look around, when I observe, when I question, I feel that our culture is rooted in our family structure and our family mm. life. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to many persons who talk about when they think of raising children, how they, if they had the opportunity, they, they may live abroad, but they, they're thankful that they have their children here in school because there is the village that they can count on. Right. If they were brought, they would not necessarily have that village. Mm 
-hmm. I think it's something that we take for granted because we don't think about it because it's all around us. When we talk about having a family um, environment and community. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's a big part of it. And I think it extends even outward to our social situations. So our social environments, like our work and our church, we find that um, our church members, they get to know our families. Some of our work colleagues, they get to know our families just because we're surrounded by um, our family um, structure in a sense. And then, and the other thing I would say, I have a, I have a little um, phrase that I like to use. Um, our culture is embedded in the Bible, the bush and the beach. <laughs> so we have a, we have strong religious undertones and carryings mm-hmm. on. We love bush tea, bush medicine. There's always a, a natural remedy for something somewhere. And the beach, we love the water. We talk a, a lot about the salt water, the healing properties. And of course, the tourists love it because of the color and, you know, all of those things. So that's my little input there on Bahamian culture. The Bible, the bush, and the beach. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I have that copy. I have that copy written. So <laughs> be very careful. Everybody has heard that. Uh, you know, copy, copyrighted, patent pended. All right. Anybody has any other idea pertaining to Bahamian culture? What is Bahamian culture? What do you think is Bahamian culture? That's almost like somebody um, asking you, who, who are you? Or, you know, what, what, do you, what are you about? Hey, can you hear me, Trevon? Hey, V. Hey. So I, I love, I love, I love the, it's copywritten. So, you know, I, <laughs> but I love that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that Bahamian culture is, it is pretty much our, it, it's a unique fin- fingerprint because it can evolve. Mm-hmm. I feel that it is rooted in our past and the understanding of ourselves with the addition for more. I think that it's like a story that we tell mm-hmm. um, that once we, ex- well, that we can always add to, or it's like a blanket because Bahamian culture is, is music. Like mm-hmm. old school, it's we're, we're so intertwined with so many other influences mm-hmm. that the truth of our culture is still hidden. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I don't think that we've even really tapped into who we are as a people. I think that the biggest issue when we talk about the human culture is that we only see it in one way. And so because we only see it one way, when we see things that are created by our own, we don't acknowledge that this is a part of culture i think that anything that is uniquely bohemian or by bohemians that has a foundation in our past or history mm-hmm. is a part of bohemian culture let me ask you this you've gone away right you've taken trips how do you identify a bohemian if they don't speak boy that's a really good question um it depends on where i go first off let's talk about florida you and the dollar. Be, B, there is a look. We have <laughs> right. a look. We have a look about us. <laughs> yeah, like if I'm in a Walmart in Florida, I know that's my people because we love a good sale. Like we ain't trying to, <laughs> like we can make that dollar stretch. But that mm-hmm. comes from, that comes from a need of having to rely on each other. Like it goes back to a communal thing where. I buy in for me and I buy in for my cousin and I buy in for Dodie and you know what I'm saying? Right. So like it still comes from some form of foundation and history. Like that's why I won't go to Walmart and buy all these things because I know that when I come back home, I'm sharing it with everyone else. I'm trying to get a good deal because this got a share. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes back yeah. to what, what Indira talks about family. Exactly. You're right. I think that, I think, but I don't know. I, I don't even know how we could, we can't really see a Bahamian unless we hear them. When you when a Bahamian opens their mouth, you know exactly who they are, you know? And that, that's v, also... V, sometimes I 
I can just look and I can tell it's a Bahamian when I'm away. Really? Yes. And I and I hope and I pray that you will get to that point as well. But there is something about us. I don't know if it's maybe because of the way we dress compared to our American counterparts, you know, Black Americans. But we carry ourselves a certain way. And so well, yeah, when I yeah. travel, I can look and I can say that person is a Bahamian. And I don't have to speak. And I look and I acknowledge and they acknowledge. And we don't have to speak. Mm -hmm. But that, that's also like, again, like in Florida, like I know for me with our family, we all dress and match and stuff. We all got a, we all dress in red on one day and black on another day and purple because we need to make sure we can find our people at a moment's notice. And even that, like making sure that we are presentable, that goes back. Like for me, I know that for me, um, my Grammy them always used to say like, oh, what if it just dropped dead? You gotta always make sure you, you look good in case. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, that's a very morbid thought what about what about how we what about our body language don't Bahamians carry a certain body language like you know someone mentioned dress which is very important but also how we care our posture how we carry ourselves I see is a little different as well from the African-American well yeah but I, I haven't actually looked I think that's the thing I haven't actually like I could see it in different I can see different postures when I look at different, like different Bahamian demographics. Mm -hmm. Like there's a different posture for like Loki. You go always like, I apologize for any junglers in the chat. Like you could always Loki tell a junglist. Like you could always Loki, even if she come out in a Sunday best, there's a, a stance and a posture. You could always tell, you know, a guy who, is can a, you tell? A, can a you tell? Can you tell a a junglist from the Bahamas from a junglist in Jamaica? Yes, I can. I can. And what is I that can. distinctive thing that you see that's different? Oh, I don't. I don't even know. I think it's normally a, one hand on the kimbo, <laughs> and it's like a slant. <laughs> like I've had so like that's a lot. That's the Bahamian junglist. Like we used to have our hand on our camera, like we waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen like a lot of Jamaican women, again, apologies, like they have their hand crossed, like they're ready to fight. Mm -hmm. Like not to say, again, um, not to, you know, but like I see like those differences, like or like a guy, let's say like a, a, a Floridian gangster do it. His pants are dropped and it's really outrageously saggy. Mm -hmm. And Again, it has their, they have a defensive, their hands are crossed, but like, I think Sylvia, they just lean on the car, chill. Like, I feel like we have a, a more chill demeanor, and it could be me. But our pants are that low, right? Our pants don't be super, super low. No, no, that's the thing. Our, ours, ours aren't as low. And I can always tell Bahamians who grow up, who grew up in the States, based on like certain things like that. Like, mm -hmm. I can tell, like, okay, you spent most of your life in the States just because of how, like, this is a, there's something you learned over there. That's, that's, right. that's not, that wasn't something here because your mother would not let you come out this house. Right. With your pants, the angles. Like. <laughs> right. Right. But those are very interesting. Um, those are very interesting observations. And, and understanding Bahamian culture really is understanding ourselves because um, we all have, that's something we all share that's something that makes us Bahamian. And I think getting to really understand what Bahamian culture is, because culture is just a way of life. So but the Bahamian way of life, we're living it. So we have different shades of culture, but we have a shade that we're actually living. So being able to to see it in others and also being able to see it in ourselves is also something that's important when you are creative and being very aware of that. You know, so I think I, I, I definitely appreciate the contributions by by Andira and yourself pertaining to that. But I want to bring up these quotes here and, and you tell me, what do you think? So Bahamas.com says, Bahamian culture is joy personified. It is a junkanoo celebration parading down the street. It's bold and colorful art. Our culture is a fresh kung salad, a lively rake and scrape tune, a welcoming smile from a stranger. Discover a glimpse into our culture. 
What's your thought? Does that represent you? Yeah. I would sorry. I would say no. <laughs> no, go ahead, B. Go ahead. Isha? Oh. Um, so I I I look at it like from the fr fresh conch salad and bold and colorful art. I feel like that is our culture. I feel like we're so mixed up with different we we are a melting pot. So I do love the idea of being a fresh conch salad. Like even when I look at my my family, like I was born and raised in Nassau. My granddaddy from Andrus, this one, my Grammy from Auckland, this one from Cat Island. Like that in and of itself is a, a mixture of different islands making it a nice little fresh conch salad. And that's just my immediate family. And we are a very colorful, I do see that like bold and colorful, like we're not, even even the shyest Bahamian, like mm -hmm. there's something that brings something out of us, like even in the idea of oral tradition or when it comes to music or when it comes to like, you you can feel a presence when when we come into a room and we, we do something, if, if that makes sense. Like I could I could relate to the bold and colorful, us being bold and colorful and like being a fresh conch salad. Okay. Yeah. That's 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 an interesting take on it. Um being bold and colorful and, and now, you know, some people don't wanna be the conch now. So I mean, no one wanna be a conch. You will be the herbs, but you know, we all got a little conch in us, a little strombus gigas. <laughs> you know, we need to take the conch back, you know, take take the conch back. <laughs> <laughs> take it back, take it back. So what yeah. about this? What about this statement? Janae Winters, she says this touristic culture Bahamians establish and maintain is tourist driven, wherein the focus is always pointed to them to ensure their money is well spent in the country. An example of this is seen through some of our Bahamian songs. They were written by, Baham by Bahamas for Bahamians, but if you look closely, a lot of them appeal to the touristic ideals of what the island life is and conforms to the tourists, essentially becoming embellished ads. What do you think of this statement? Do you believe that? A lot of what we may think we enjoy or see around as Bahamian culture as something that was is more touristy. Um, with this, I can appreciate the statement. I can appreciate the stance. I don't completely agree with it. I think going back to what V talked about with our oral tradition and our storytelling and the way we we transfer knowledge and we transfer history is through storytelling. I think our songs are an extension of that because if you, and I don't know too many of the, the latest songs, but going back to the, the, I would call the classic Bahamian songs by the Bahamian artists, um, they tell stories, mm -hmm. right? And then they infuse our music into it. So when we look at, you know, um, that gal look good, or, you know, um, party in the backyard. Mm -hmm. These are songs that tell stories mm -hmm. from our, our perspectives and different aspects of our Bahamian life. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that tourists enjoy it is awesome. Mm -hmm. That means that they're getting a part of our culture. They're embracing it. But mm -hmm. I don't... I don't know that the songs are tourist driven. Mm -hmm. um, I think the songs can be used as advertisements mm -hmm. for our for our culture and um, to to draw people in. And yeah. and again, I think if we were to expand on this, I think that will allow tourists to see more of our our life and our living as opposed to the gloss and the glitz and the glamour of the, the big resorts. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they just want to see pure island life and island living. That's right. That's true. That's true. So what about this? This statement by Dr. Ian Sean. He, he says, migration, memory, and the marketplace do not exhaust the list of factors shaping our art, but they are principal players in its production. Whereas... Africa often becomes a subject of longing and idealization in Jamaican reggae music and Bahamian music. The island is a more compelling object of 
idealization, nostalgia, romanticism, and yearning. What are your thoughts on that? Because I Me? mean, in Jamaican <laughs> music, you've normally you've normally hear that you know you got a uh, you know you, they're talking a lot about in the reggae music, talking a lot about you know being in chains, what happened, being taken away from our homeland, and a lot of music. And then, uh, you know, you hear Oh My Andres, she, you know, you hear um, Sailor Man song, you're, talking, you're, you're hearing about what's going on in the island. There isn't much people who uh, have started off their, their lyrics with Nassau, really, except just recently with Nassau as the capital of the Bahamas. Um, but most of the Bahamian songs have been mostly speaking about island life in my opinion what do you what is what, what are your opinions um i i love there are a lot of songs that talk about island life and and to be honest i think the reason why we have where jamaica talks about africa and we focus yeah. on the island is because i think that island living is the most reminiscent of african culture I think that, like, there is none of us essentially, you know, like, we don't have memories of Africa before we came here. Um, but the idea of community, the idea of, like, oral tradition, passing on knowledge, that that kind of, that genetic knowledge, I think that we have that genetic memory. Um, we see more of that shown on the island, and I think that's why... Um, that is why we we focus on on the romanticism mm -hmm. of the family island, where Nassau is very um, fast paced and is constantly evolving, and I feel like Nassau has become more of a of, of a tourist trap in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the city, it's the place to go to, um, and 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 we see it like it has some of the the greater infrastructures as far as like schools, um, hospitals, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if it sounds, if my comment sounds ignorant, please, I mean, people correct me. Um, you've but you've I been on the family like, islands as well, and and I'm sure a lot yeah. of your students wanted to come to Nassau and live here. So, a lot, and a, a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot of kids, when I was in Spanish Wells, they were petrified. Oh of yeah, Nassau. yeah, they were like, it's so violent, Miss Roll. They they literally asked me, Miss Roll, have you ever been shot? I'm like, wow. no, like why why you think I was shot? Like, you know, but I will tell you one thing living on the island and moving back to Nassau, I miss the island. Mm. I miss it. I miss it because it's not congested. It's it's not as congested. The air is nicer. The beaches are pure. It's it's not defiled. Mm -hmm. I think that's and that's and I think that that's why you feel like, too many people, people are in your space. Exactly. But I think that that's that's where the comparison of Africa is for, I think that that's what Africa is for Jamaicans, mm -hmm. where it's a place where it's undefiled. Mm -hmm. it, it's not been influenced by European or the white man's hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, uh, because a lot of family islands are, are self-reliant mm -hmm. and self-sustainable, mm -hmm. it gives that kind of air aura, aura, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I, I know it is like to not have food and all my family is here, and mm -hmm. I couldn't go to the store and my neighbor's like, hey, girl, I cook something you want, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the way that my family is. Mm -hmm. like, because a lot of my family, you know, came from different family islands. They grew up on the, on the island. Right. So they have that practice and that mentality. But like for, for people who don't have that kind of access, the family island is little Africa. It is a place where even accents and dialects are preserved. You could you could tell someone from certain islands and they are strong. Mm -hmm. Like Cat Island people that wax station, what that <laughs> W like you hear that and it's mm -hmm. and there's no one condemning it. There's no one criticizing it. There's no one, you know, it's 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 embraced. Right. And I think that that's that's it. And the reality of it is is that family island I won't say family island. I can't speak of family island because I, I had that experience in Spanish Wells where a lot of cultural stuff mm -hmm. they had, they were not aware of. Like Booking Barabi stories and Nancy's, like stuff like that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I introduced them to um, different artists and like Blind Blake and stuff, they had no awareness of those of those people. But I also realized that that's our that's our issue too with our culture. Like like even with the saying says migration, memory, and marketplace, memory. Our culture is preserved through telling stories and 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 actually making it a part of our memories. Mm -hmm. And so, I feel like in Nassau, we don't practice making it a memory. We don't practice a lot of things that are unique to us. Mm -hmm. But then when you go on the island, you gotta you know you experience that. Now you have that experience. Like for me, I go in the bush, go put cocoa blob. Will I go in the bush right now in Nassau? No. No. But <laughs> I did that. I did that when I was in Lutra. I was going to the bush. You, you see what I'm saying? It's 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 like, mm -hmm. but I did it as a child growing up. And again, um, like in said with family, like I had family who grew up that way. So they taught me how to do that. They taught me how to climb the tree and and you know, they encouraged me to scrape my knee and to, you know, and get and get messy. When I couldn't play ring play at school, I was able to play in the backyard of my great grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a, a culture unique to me. And, yeah. and I know a lot of my friends who I grew up with don't even share that experience and they haven't shared that experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, so a lot of it, I think that that's why island life is so nostalgic because it represents a little bit of Africa where everything is undefiled, where it's embraced and, and, there isn't a need to show culture. We just, we just, we are Literally. culture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a wonderful um, expression of it all. And you've experienced a lot of that. And I was just thinking about how you used to speak about traveling on the boat to get, was it the boat to get to school? Or yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you were traveling on the boat. So that migration back and forth and the marketplace and all of that um, was really in your life. You know, how do you get to work? You take the boat, you know, and how do you see your family? They're, they're everywhere, you know. It's not a car rides away. You, you have to literally think about getting to your family, and um, each thing carries its own its own thing. Uh, let's see here. So I see Moya just joined the group. Um, I'm going to pause here with my presentation. She has some updates and some uh, opportunities for our filmmakers uh, with the... Uh, December coming up, so I'll just allow her to just give a few updates, and then we'll continue our presentation. Moya, are you there? Okay, Moya, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, you can begin uh, in terms of the updates for Culture Month. All right, good night, everybody. Um, we are, um, Culture Month kicks off technically tomorrow night, which is the 30th of November, um, but it's in December. Uh, Cultural Heritage Month is in December. We're still technically in Sports Heritage Month, which is this month, November. Um, we begin with the Christmas tree lighting ceremony tomorrow. Um, and then the calendar and everything comes out with regards to film. Um, we have about three initiatives that are specifically with regards to film. And that is the uh, TV screenings that we invite persons. We did um, we did it for last year's Culture Month, but it was it was approved a bit late. So we the, the screenings happened in January this year. We're beginning actually tomorrow um, at six on Cable Bahamas, and then on Sunday at seven thirty on ZNS, and Island Love TV would be Tuesday nights and Wednesday afternoons. And so, for persons who may have uh, worked on any projects this year that you are open to having screened on these platforms, or if you have a trailer for a project that is coming up and you want to get the word out there, you can. Um, Email me um, so that I can uh, begin packaging those ahead of time. The other event that we have is we have a, uh, we're working with different community organizations and constituencies to do uh, film screenings in their community. Again, to get the, uh, get the Bahamian 
film content out on a larger scale. Uh, so far, we have made arrangements with the Garden Hills constituency, which is the constituency of our minister, as well as the Elizabeth Estates. Those are the two uh, constituencies that we have spoken to. Um, and we're also uh, waiting for confirmation from Fox Hill Community Center. Um, we have a film competition and we have five filmmakers that will be leading that. Um, similar to something we did last year, but last year we had it with specifically filmmakers. So there were teams of filmmakers who worked on a scavenger hunt slash PSA this year. It will be a short film, no scavenger hunt. They can focus on the film. Um, and then they haven't, it's like a eight hour situation. So you have like maybe about four hours to do whatever, three, three to four hours, and then you edit, um, you have about a three to four, three to five minute short film um, that we are asking be done by six o'clock because we're going to we have a peck and paste on that. That is a Sunday. That particular competition is on a Sunday um, and it will screen at six o'clock uh, before the peck and paste event. Peck and paste is uh, a play on sip and paint, but instead of uh, painting, it will be pasting. Uh, costume so it's like uh, a mask and you they have different juggernauts who will work with you with that um, and vendors will be there selling food and so the screening will happen during that event um, and so those are the three uh, uh, film-based activities we also have culture on the key uh, I know at the last meeting I had spoken about not the last meeting because the last meeting was a color correction one but the meeting um, uh, when Dion uh, Gibson was here, we spoke about the port. It's actually going to be at Arawaki now, and that is the 15th, which is a Friday, in two weeks from Monday. Um, that is the, it is a book fair, a children's show, a film screening, as well as a fashion show on Arawaki. And that event begins at two o'clock with the book fair and it will end. Uh, there will be two film screenings during the day, one around one about five, like five to six thirty. And then another one once the fashion show is done uh, uh, later in the very later in the evening, like nine thirty. Um, and so we invite persons to come out to that event um, as well as, like I said, if you have any projects that you wish to, if you're okay with a uh, screening, you can let us know, like, okay, this can only be done, shown for this time or whatever your, uh, whatever your request is. And then we will, uh, be sure to let, you know, everybody, you know, make sure that that is, that is honored. If you have any questions, you can let me know. There are a number of other culture events. Um, I just focused on the film, but if you have questions on the other culture events, you can let me know that as well. All right. Uh, Maya, tell them how they can reach you. For those who do not know how to reach me, uh, my email uh, is moyamthompson at bahamas.gov.bs. Um, that's M-O-Y-A-M Thompson at bahamas.gov.bs. Um, you can send me, um, you can shoot me an email, um, send me a link or whatever the case may be. Um, and then I will be sure to get back to you. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so so everyone, hope you guys been taking your notes. Uh, Culture Month is gonna be busy and we want to show solidarity with any effort to do with filmmaking, um, any effort to do with uh, theater, anything that can help the arts and the creative process become more popular and more supported. Um, so that's gonna be done with numbers and agreement, all right? So uh, so let's do our best to see how we can be a part of what's going on um, with Culture Month. All right, so I'm going to continue here from, uh, from this quote. And uh, we're talking about migration memory in the marketplace. We were just talking to V about her experiences um, traveling to school and back on the water. Um, the, each island having its different characteristic um, from the next. And, you know, we're, we're hearing it in Bahamian music, we're seeing it in how we live, but, uh, you know, are we seeing it in film? Are we seeing it in, in theater? Um, you know, and if not, why? You know, so, so these are important questions 
to ask ourselves. And another aspect of things is is trauma. And trauma is really a shaping. And, and when we think about trauma, sometimes it's it's mostly associated with the psychological. So while the term trauma generally refers to an individual experience of response to an adverse event, collective trauma describes the psychological reactions of society to a traumatic event. Collective trauma is more complex as it reflects how major life events witnessed by a large group can lead to cultural shifts and societal changes. For Bahamians, Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic are two such events. So this was written by Christina Johnson and Helen and Roll in The Guardian. And it reminds me that this can come, you know, trauma on a, on a shared level can happen in so many ways. I remembered um, the tragic deaths of Miles Monroe and his team as they was going in as they were going into Freeport and how many people were going through that together and how many people even now are still going through that. And of course we know Dorian and COVID-19 would have been our most recent shared events. Um, you hear hurricane coming, you're not just joking around eating chips anymore. You are preparing you are not, you are taking that very seriously. And um, everybody has been touched in some way from Hurricane Dorian, even though it were it was over Abaco and Freeport, you were connected to somebody who went through a harrowing experience. So you heard of something that just made you, it changed you. And that's what trauma is, it shapes you, it, it changes your behavior. So trauma is, is very important to um the 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 audience because there are certain things that shape that shape a people and trauma is one of them so that's something very important to um, to note so how do we harness idealization nostalgia romanticism yearning and trauma in the context of bohemian audience so here we know idealization is the act of thinking of or representing someone or something as better than that person or thing really is, right? So you, when you idealize somebody, so I put here some idealizations, um, not mine, but some people I feel idealize pig feed sows. Now, if you love pig feed sows, I feel like you idealize pig feed sows because I feel like you're starving yourself. Um, I tried pig feet sauce, and I was like, everybody's talking so good about this pig feet sauce, and I can't even swallow it. What am I supposed to eat on the pig feet sauce? But um, a lot of people like it. A lot of people like it, and they think it's the best thing since uh, sliced bread. So uh, a lot of people like pineapple pizza, and they idealate idealize pineapple pizza. Some people idealize another person. They may say this person is awesome, this person could do no wrong. But I think these idealizations are important. Important to note because these are things that we feel strongly about. You know, when we think about creating, in the process of creation, we're not thinking about something that's muted or something that we really don't have any emotions tied to. We wanna think about things that carry emotions, emotion carriers. An idealization is, is definitely something that carries emotion with it. People will fight over pineapple pizza. People will fight over uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They will fight over um, PLP and FNM. They will fight. You know, they idealize these things. does not mean that those things are the best. It just means that they think it's the best very strongly. And what about nostalgia? A feeling of pleasure and also slight sadness when you think about things that happened in the past, all right? Now, some things that might be nostalgic to me is buying salty after school. Anybody bought salty after school? Nobody bought salty after school? Only me? Yeah. You buy salty after school. And sometimes you used to get the cup, you used to get the cup with the, the Kool-Aid in it, and they used to freeze it, and you used to flip it upside down. And, and you used to go home with that. Now, the thing is, is that a lot of countries, they end up with that. But if you, did, if you were to ask somebody who was born, you know, 
you know, before the 2000s, maybe, I don't know, my student Brianna's inside home, maybe she could tell me if they still eat salty in school. But I know that used to be a part of our shared experience. Then, you know, being a track star and being a national hero, I think also is a part of our nostalgia. Um, we're not track stars, but we think we're track stars because we got Shawnee, we got Tonique, we got Steven, we got so many people who are running at a high level. They're representing us, they're carrying us on, on their back. And when we saw them win, that's something that stays in our mind. So when the next set of track athletes go to the Olympics or the Carifta, we are we are holding our breaths because we recognize ourselves to be somebody different because of what we remember. Our memories have changed us from the time when we had those goal, uh, golden girls. Our memories of ourselves has been changed. Yeah, do we see these in films? Do we see these in our Bahamian films? Have we seen a, uh, a track movie? Something that's focused on track? I'm not talking about rain. Somebody who just run and track, you know, in a part of the movie, I'm talking about your premise is along something that uh, we have emotions in. Our memories hold these emotions. Um, I haven't seen the salty show up in a movie as yet. Hope, hope so. Hope, hopefully it shows up in, in a stage play. But, um, but we have to think deeply about the things that gives us a feeling of pleasure when we think about it, things in the past, right? Now, romanticism. Romanticism seems like idealization, but it describes things in a way that makes them sound more exciting or mysterious than they really are. In fact, this was an entire period of art, um, maybe a century or two ago. Um, the Titanic actually is, is along the romantic, romanticism sort of theme, you know, these, these lovers meet on the ship that's going down. And it sounds so good, but man, the ship's going down, you know? After I saw that video with the Blue Lagoon boat, I say, no boy, I don't wanna be in no sinking ship. But they made that sound so good, the Titanic. You know, we watched it, we loved it, right? And um, so I have had things that may, have so may sound good, you know? Lost at sea with a love interest. You know, I'd like to see a movie like that, you know, somebody that maybe you're fighting with and then they end up being a love interest. You had to survive, you had to fight off the barracudas, you know, something, something like that, that involves our waters, something that involves our ecosystem and a secret affair on a private island, you know. A lot of these little keys out there, what could be happening on these keys that's so grand and so exciting and mysterious, you know. Um, I think we will do well taking advantage of those. Um, does anybody have any ideas pertaining to idealization, nostalgia, and romanticism that, you know, that, they, that they're thinking of right now that can be a good premise? Anybody's wheels are turning? Yeah, I do. What you got? <laughs> um, I, I always like to explore the idea of ring play. I mm -hmm. think that... Um, Ring play was always something that I enjoy. I feel like it's it's a bit nostalgic because when I was in primary school, like we used to have to sneak lunchtime in the back of the the our building to play, and like there were prefects who I was a prefect as well, <laughs> who was like a lookout. So sometimes we'd be like lookouts because it was always considered vulgar. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at like the history of ring play, it's like it's it's cultural. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like this idea of a mother or an aunt or someone trying to get their kid into ring play or, or, or um, remembering the stories, uh, the moves and stuff of ring play and trying to like teach her, her daughter, like trying to, like, trying to get a 21st century kid, like, a, or not 21st century, like a 2023 kid involved in ring play and getting outside versus mm. staying indoors and being on their phone i mm. think that would be an interesting concept like a, a mother's journey of something that or a, a parent's journey where something that was discouraged mm -hmm. for them as a child they think is important you know 
I think that'll be an interesting story or concept to play with. That sounds good. That sounds good. In fact, even your own story sounds good as well. Um, with somebody having to look out and you guys trying to go in the back and you the prefect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, tension, the tension is there, you know. Is the principal going to catch them? You know, what's she going to say? Maybe she joins in. Who knows? Yeah, you know? you're open. That would be fun. <laughs> Anybody have any other ideas pertaining to idealization, nostalgia, and romanticism? Anybody? And I know we got some writers in the room. Tara, oh, you got to have one for me. And I know Les is a director. Les, you there? Indy, you got something? I do, but I was waiting on someone else um, to speak to give them a turn. Um, I like um, I like B's suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, part of me is still hung up on the fact that you don't like pig feet sauce, but you know that's a conversation <laughs> we can have on another day. I I starved that night. I could not swallow it. How, what well, part that's, what the, eat? that's what the Johnny cake is for. What I <laughs> Johnny cake. <laughs> <laughs> Give me no Johnny King. <laughs> but you know, that could be a story too. TM sheep, because I have a sheep salt and tongue, those kind of guys. Exactly. Oh, so sheep yeah. tongue, pig Versus... feet, like all yeah. of these things. Oh, oh right. That could be a fun thing too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the church, mm -hmm. the church sauce out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, and like even talking about that, when you think about, say, you have, you know, a, a, a bohemian relative who, who grew up abroad and now has come home and they always hear their aunt or their grandmother talk about this pig feet sauce. And so they're, they're, they're glad that they're finally here to try it and experience it. And so now it's, what does that look like when they try it for the first time? Mm. Do they like it or is it a letdown, you oh. know? And then what, what emotions do that, does that evoke? Mm -hmm. And how does it that can, play? It out? can be fun. It can be fun. I've yeah. had relatives from the U.S. come in and um, what was it now? I'm trying to remember the meal that my mother gave uh, my cousin and they were eating it so wrong. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know if it was pea soup and dough or something like that, but they thought that it wasn't done. <laughs> they didn't think it was done. But they ended up, you know, warming up to it later on, you know. But um, I think anything, I think film uh, that, that surrounds food is going to be a hit definitely over here. It's going to be a hit. That's something that we carry with us. That's, that's an emotional thing for us. Just like you say, you on the you can't believe I I I ain't eat no feet no pig feet sauce. You you can't be on the fence with that. <laughs> right, it's, it's love it or hate it. You can't, yeah, you can't can't. on the fence. Yeah, we are on the fence. Yeah, and then when you talk about nostalgia, you know, mm -hmm. just um how you described it and everything, my mind immediately went to say someone who 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 is a musician, you know, and going back to 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 these very eloquent um, um, discussion on 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 Bahamian music to, focused around island life. Mm -hmm. um, I am thinking of uh, an older, retired Bahamian artist or musician who in his heyday, you know, cranked out all the hits. Right. So there's a certain feeling of, of joy and pleasure he has when he reminisces about that. But now... Right. He gets in the company of these younger artists, mm. you know, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, go on the critiquing end of, of, of the younger artists, but now he, he's a bit frustrated because now the music is just focusing on, on jumping and dancing and whining. Uh, and it's not necessarily the island. Right. So then that could, that could, we could have a story come out of that. All the, all the promoters want the younger people stuff now because they're going with, right. with all the hype, right? Right. You exactly. watch the movie Crazy Crazy Heart? I don't think so. I don't. And if you have the time, you know, there's a movie called Crazy Heart where this guy, you know, he was he was big in his heyday, you know, playing rock and roll. And uh now 
the music has changed so much and the stars have changed so much. You know, he, he drinks a lot, but he gets certain gigs, you know, and his agent is like, man, I don't know how much more gigs I can get you. But going through the film, even though he's playing at these very, you know, drop down places compared to what he used to play to, you know, you could kind of hear some of his old music and uh, you could kind of see how it's taken people back to certain, you know, certain times in their life. And he ends up, this reporter uh, ends up finding him, trying to get a story on him. They end up having a thing. And um, somebody ends up calling him on stage to, to be at this big concert. So just as you're saying, you know, where he's now with this, this younger group, he, this guy ended up with this younger star who had a way of doing things that he didn't necessarily like. But what he did when the younger star started to play some music, and mm -hmm. the star got stuck. He he joined in, and it was like right. a end of their music. Right. And, and they it, they can yeah. help. They can help each other. Right, and that's the universal yeah. story that comes at yes. the end of the niche. So the niche has to begin, but the universal story has to end. You know, friendship or generations working together, that sort of thing. But just like what mm -hmm. you said, you you were literally on to a a niche storyline that could work. It has mm -hmm. worked. Yeah. Yeah. So just from yeah. that nostalgia. Right, right. And I the thing that I like about um what Tara does is that she can take a universal story and she puts her spin on it because you know Tara is very much into the cosplay and the 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 techno um look mm -hmm. of of films and special effects and and things like that. And so I think even for for persons who don't necessarily want to do a cookie cutter type of film. You can always incorporate these ideas mm -hmm. into into your film, into your storyline, just so that it makes it bohemian. Yeah, yeah. And that that comes with being able to do that fusion is a part of. I mean, being able to do it, you have to know if you have the right ingredients. And definitely, Tara has been in that in that vein, you know, playing with that so, those sort of ideas. So, um, definitely looking forward to a lot of things coming from from Cinemorphosis in the future. So, the next set of uh, ideas here are yearning and trauma. So, yearning, a strong feeling of wishing for something, especially something that you cannot have or easily get. That can be a high school crush, you know. You're looking at this person for from grade ten to grade twelve, ain't nothing happen. That's that's that yearning, that's that longing. Qualifying for Carifta Olympics, we have a tradition of that. Trying to, uh, you know, so many kids are going out there trying to get their chance to represent the country, and that's a yearning for them. They're waking up four o'clock in the morning to train. They're training at four o'clock in the afternoon working so hard, whether it's swimming, running, you know, basketball, they're trying to represent their country. They're trying to make something of themselves and they, they want their country to be proud of them. They want their parents, who's an extension of that, to be proud of them. And then that goes to being accepted by family. And we know that family was a big thing, especially at the beginning of this conversation when Indiris brought it up. Family, um, is what makes this country feel like ours. You know, if if the, all the people that you knew who your family left, you, I don't think this place would feel as warm. So the people who are in this country, the land itself is one thing, but the people who inhabit the land, they, you know, people who remember you, people who remember the things that you like as well, can make you feel more accepted. So yearning is 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 something that is a very a unique idea. Trauma is also very unique um, because that's something that you don't easily forget. Now, all of these things are in the memory. All of these things require memory. Um, it causes severe and lasting emotional shock and pain caused by an extremely upsetting experience or a case of such shock happening. So I'm thinking like a loss of life from natural disasters like Dorian, right? Like um, Joaquin. Uh, let's talk about the mailboat sinking, right? Uh, building fires. We've had a couple that lo that ended in uh, loss of life. And people don't easily forget those things. 
the straw market fire, people don't easily forget those things. Loss of lives from COVID-19, a lot of people we've lost um, from that, that pandemic. And um, a lot of memories from that pandemic. You know, if you hear a menace one more time, you just, you, you just can't do it. Um, and the term started to go around about the competent authority because they know he's going to dress up and he's going to come on TV and shut everything down. And that became our lives. So those stories that surround that is going to carry a lot of emotions. Mysterious deaths of well-known public figures, as I mentioned, uh, Miles Monroe. Um, then we had the death of even um, a local politician's husband. Um, we've had we have had so many uh, interesting things that have happened. Um, even persons that are well known, you know, investors have 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 died mysteriously, and you know we don't see a lot of stories that kind of follow these sort of themes. You know, rape and abuse by priests, pastors, coaches, politicians, role models. Now the thing is this, because we're tight knit. Um, we have we have kind of a history of not telling on each other. We don't want to have persons not like us because we were the whistleblowers or we were the person that spilled the beans. But these are themes that, if they were explored, they would gather a lot of traction. They would gather a ton of traction. So, um, because these even though people aren't opening up their mouth so much, it's staying in their mind. They're outraged, they're shocked, and a lot of persons don't know what to do, but they're looking for someone to say it for them before they have the courage to even say it. So, so we think about yearning and trauma. What are things that of yearning and trauma that you feel are, are something that you'd like to, to explore? Um, well, I mean, uh, when I think about the yearning part, if I were to just make it as simple as possible, it's the yearning of maybe a child to be involved in John Canoe, mm. right? And just wishing and hoping that one day he could, he could, um, you know, be in the John Canoe band or be a John Canoe dancer or maybe a little girl, you know, to be a John Canoe dancer. Right. And that could take uh, that I, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. something, some like you know, a yearning. Um, I don't know if you guys remember. I think it was last year. Yeah, before I, since twenty twenty, my years have gotten mixed up. Mm -hmm. But I think it was last year when Junkanoo was back, mm -hmm. and there was this um, the costume, the bird costume. Mm -hmm. Do we remember that? The bird and costume. How, which group? Yeah, there was this bird costume. Oh, I think I think public, I remember it. Yeah, I think I remember. Yeah, it. <laughs> that the public really just eviscerated the group, yeah, and then when the story up. came out, that the man said that his son actually pasted this costume, and he wanted oh, to paste uh, the costume all on his own, and he finally was able to do it, and the public just because they didn't know, they just tore it to pieces. Wow. Yeah, but that, you know, it, was me, such that, a competitive, that it was it was such yeah. a competitive thing. It started off as almost like a, a battle. So right. I guess the kid just walked straight into that. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So something like that, I think of when I think of, you know, a, a storyline yeah, focused yeah. around yearning. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. I hope a lot of you guys are writing these things down. There's a lot of good ideas coming from this. You know what I've always wanted to see? Mm -hmm. What I'm I'm low-key obsessed with it. And I but that's also why I haven't touched it. Um when you talk about the, the mysterious deaths, mm -hmm. Sahario, that's Sahario's murder. Oh yeah. There are so many, there have been so many different, like there are books on it. I think Ms. Ethel's kitchen played on it. But like to have a visual depiction of something like that mm -hmm. um or even um people just being out to sea and you just not know where they are yes that's a big part of our culture 
yeah that is the most terrifying feeling especially like when I have friends with smaller boats and they're gonna go to another island buy these little boats I'm like that is that is that is scary. That automatically me, yeah that automatically my, set me in a panic my grandfather was born on a sandbank the boat went down and his mother had to give birth to him on the sandbank you know See, that's crazy yeah but that's but also these are stories that don't end up in our films in our in our place. Yeah. You know, a lot of opportunity. I think the issue with trauma too is that I this it goes back to our I feel like it goes back to like us being so rooted in in religion mm -hmm. that we don't like it's discouraged to even talk about traumatic things, even through film. Mm. Like it's it's not something that though I think it can relate and really pull people, like it's not something that and I think that it's it's a part of like if we say, okay, we're gonna market this outside of of our of our country where like that's not a good reflection of the Bahamas. That's not a true reflection. You know, like when you talk about people who have been raped and they know they're rapists, like they're rape, they're they're their aggressor is someone who comes to the house. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Or a child growing up with domestic violence and they their parents are fighting and then they come to school the next day like nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like even even the way that we look at um even cut it. <laughs> But some people, that's very traumatic. Like, mm. I I know it's like to be playing dodgeball <laughs> with the household objects. Oh, geez. And I can laugh at it now because it, it's made me stronger. But I do remember how I felt as a kid. As a kid like, yeah. why is why this woman trying to hurt me? Like, you know right. what I mean? And so it's like, it. I don't think that, it's not to say that the stories can't happen. I think that there's such a fear of, how we are portrayed do you think it's um, you think it's self-induced or you think that there are people that are actually out there trying to stop you from doing it i think it's 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 a mixture i think it's self-induced because of culture like i know for me certain things like i know my mom would hate me writing about just because of her fear of what of how people would see me because mm -hmm. i wrote about it not even even if it's fictional like i could write about trying to go to, to venus mm -hmm. and she you know or like for me right now mermaids like i'm really um i'm very excited to do something with mermaids and and and, and the blue holes mm -hmm. but mermaids have had roots in you know like in in um and like demonic occultish, you know, like there's like mermaids are spirits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So even as something as simple as that is no people could thank you this and oh, you know, you know what I mean? So it's it's a part of self-induced because you're you're brought up with it, so you already hear the voice. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that um I guess too, depending on where you go, I know for me as um as a teacher, like little projects I did with my students, the principal would not clear them because they didn't feel that like it was a positive portrayal of of either culture or of the school. Mm. And I'm like, it, it doesn't matter if it's positive. It's a true portrayal. Yeah. And at the end of the day, there's someone that may want to hear about it. Like, even when I do plays, um, I remember I had a play on teenage pregnancy mm -hmm. that I wanted to do at the school. And my principal was livid when we did it. And she was like, you're promoting teenage pregnancy. Like, no, I'm telling the story because you have teenage mothers in the school as we speak right you know so it's it's stuff like that where i've i've seen where and that's these teenage, are small teenage students. mothers can be an audience i mean there's a lot of persons who who had children early um who may not be seeing themselves in film and uh juno was like a hit you know, she was a yeah. teenage mother and it was a different way of telling the story. You don't always have to go trying to beat somebody is, you know, beat somebody over the head with an issue. Sometimes I think we take ourselves a little bit too seriously. 
sometimes yeah. we can approach a theme differently in a way that's kind of fresh, you know? So I, I, I do understand where you're coming from in terms of, of feeling hesitant, you know, and maybe it is stunting our development story wise. Um, but I think we do need to recognize that and find ways around that because there are a lot of opportunities there. Because uh, you don't have to talk about somebody exactly. You can you can create fictional characters. You can put them in impact role. You can you can put them in antagonist roles, and um, and I think it will um, break out and and allow people to you know have actually want to see it. And there's an audience for it. I'm sure. You know, these are strong antagonistic identities that we can use. So I I do think that. I'd be interested in seeing how we can move forward and, and, and actually approaching those things, and especially in the writing aspect. It doesn't take any money for you to go and actually write those stories. And um, who knows what the stories are going to be once it's done and it's rewritten and it's rewritten. Who knows what it's going to be? Um, so I think we just need to take a shot at it. So what are the effects on the audience of the idea, idealization, nostalgia, romanticism, yearning, and trauma. So it evokes a memory and imagination through shared experiences. It creates instant connection to character and investment within the plot. And it offers the audience a way to explore emotions, attitudes, trauma, past experiences, traditions, and possibilities within a shared cultural context. So that's everything what we were talking about. Um, um, this is what it can do um, for the audience. Now, how do we apply this to the story? So it establishes relatable bohemian settings and characters for your story. So when you were talking about the ring play, you were already thinking about school. You're already thinking about a bohemian school. You were already thinking about a place that you remember. Uh, when you're thinking about a boat sinking, you're already thinking about a sandbank or something, someplace out there in a relatable setting. Maybe somebody trying to get back from school back to home. Maybe somebody trying to get from Nassau back to Andres and something happens. So so you're actually creating settings and characters that are real and feel real. Sometimes when we make a lot of the movies that are inspired by what's happening in the United States, we're, we're thinking of some a character that's just like that, um, and we don't really get to flesh it out because it's not in our memory. Um, but these sort of uh, concepts can allow a more natural Bahamian development around our characters and settings. So it fuels the big lie of the protagonist. Does anybody know what the big lie, what is a big lie? No. Well, a big lie is a concept that um, is within a character that drives the character forward. It's, it's his, uh, it's the lie he tells himself or herself. It's the lie they tell themselves in order to do what they're doing. So let's say, for instance, uh, you have a car driver. He thinks that he has to he has to get a big sponsor in order to um, win a race. That's what he thinks. He thinks that if he stays down, he stays with this broke down sponsor, he's never going to win a race. So he's trying to do things to be flashy so that he can service this big lie. Um, and what happens is somewhere in the story, he's going to be confronted with the truth that, you know, it's what's inside you rather than what's, you know, who's funding you. So that may be his truth, but he has to go through this journey to understand that truth, that some of the people that he is disregarding, some of the people that he's not paying attention to, are some of the people who could help him to actually win. So that's the importance of a big lie. Every major protagonist needs a big lie in order to have a a good level of development for the story you know i can say my big lie is um for a story is i think that without a gun this guy is going to kill me or i can think that um i need to be uh cool and popular to win the attention of of this girl in high school that's a big lie and, and it's going to allow me to do certain things to try to live out that lie until I run into somebody um, or until I do it. And the person who helps me do it is the person who I actually really want, but 
I didn't know that I really wanted them because I was following this lie. So when you when you investigate idealism, uh, the nostalgia, the romanticism, the yearning, the trauma, you can you can plug one of those into your big lie, such as let's say the trauma is you know um, I believe that um, pig feet is is gonna kill me, you know, and that might be my big lie. And somewhere along the journey, I understand that man, this 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 big lie, big lie. <laughs> I I may say like this story. Just, you know, I, I somehow run into a character, a teacher that maybe teaches me by the midpoint that, you know, this isn't the truth. And I started to try to change my ways until I run into the antagonist where, you know, somebody ain't cooked a big feet too good and I and I really down about it. I you know. But I had a big lie. And every major character is driven by that. So you can actually go into any one of these these concepts and find your big lie. So it also creates compelling and formidable antagonists. So as we spoke about, you know, the, the rape, we spoke about the, the natural disasters, even just people robbing right now at Christmas time, why people trying to get in your car, robbing all that stuff. So um, these are things that are happening around us. These are things that we don't have to conjure up. These are things we are hearing about. So we can easily develop compelling and formidable antagonists. If we, if we think about a trauma, somebody getting robbed before, if you've been robbed before, you know you weren't trying to get robbed again. That trauma, that shaped you, that changed you. Maybe you got a gun now. That, that changed your behavior. So um, how do you use the things that is in your memory right now to create compelling and formidable antagonists? And then it also creates dynamic, fun and game story beats that maximize storytelling in a Bahamian context. So, you know, when you're talking about things that you remember, you know, the girl, maybe the guy is taking this girl to the fry and they're going to get this. And, and you're going to places that you've probably gone or you've gone to places that you've heard about. And these are places that are accessible. It's not like, oh, he takes it down to Wall Street or takes it down to, you know, Venice Beach. You know, you might ha you might hear about Venice Beach, but you ain't really experienced that. You have no emotions about it. But you can actually uh, use scenes that you actually have emotions about because you actually have memory of them. All right. So what does all this have to do with newspaper and social media? So I'm going to run through this. So sourcing newspapers, a script idea based on a news story could be a shortcut to finding an audience for your script. It's newsworthy. First of all, the work has been done for you because they're not going to be putting things inside a newspaper that, you know, is, isn't interesting. All right. So then from that newspaper article, you could find a protagonist. And guess what? This person would be in your country. So they're culturally identifiable. Contain circumstances and goals that are familiar and engaging. So you're looking at something, a uh, uh, man break, break out of prison cell and goes and hides in uh, Texaco, in the back of Texaco. Now, you can literally say that, well, he's trying to get free. And he's in the back of Texaco and he's trying to get free. And maybe there's a police there getting gas, you know. So you can create, you can use those circumstances and build on it. You don't have to start from ground up, all right? Also, you can identify, conceptualize, and utilize idealization, nostalgia, romanticization, yearning, or trauma in the story without starting from scratch. All of these things, you can pull from these stories. You can pull nostalgia. You can, you, inside the stories, you can kind of tell things that you remember. You can kind of see uh, situations where somebody may have maybe idealized uh, trying to get this money from this place and this was going to do good for that Christmas. Uh, they do all this Christmas shopping. They, they won't go to the store and then realize that um, this is where the robber was. Romanticization, feeling like they can go on this trip to Greece and then they get stuck and, you know, they get stuck in Harbor Island, realized that was better, you know, and that was a new story. But, um, but we can actually go in these things and we can actually pull out the things that we need to actually gives a, give us a better story. And the thing is, um, if I was to give you examples of stories that were sourced from newspaper, a nightmare, anybody remember a nightmare on Elm Street? Because I do. Yeah, that was scary as hell when I first I saw do. it. That messed me up. I mean, even the cockroach scene. 
but it was based on a newspaper article from the from the Los Angeles Times reporting on a series of deaths in Southeast Asia where young men apparently died in the middle of their ter terrifying nightmares. And then uh, for persons who know the movie Bigger Than Life, um, that was uh, based on a New York article, 10 Feet Tall, from 1955. So they went back to pick up that article a year back, and they was able to have a script and put that into production. And uh, it was talking about a teacher's descent into addiction after his doctor prescribes him cortisone. Everybody, I wouldn't say everybody, but most people should understand the movie The Perfect Storm. And it was based on an actual article by the outside um, called The Storm from journalist Sebastian Junger. And that was published in 1994. So we've seen evidences of some big movies that actually came from pulling so on sourcing from newspapers. So we can do that here. Social media is also something that you can use because why it's measurable. You can see how many people jump on a thread. You can see how many people like this idea. You can see how many people are engaging and sharing. So it's measurable. So if you start to pick up storylines and ideas from maybe a post, whether it's an Instagram, whether it's a Facebook video, whether it's a WhatsApp video, you can see how much thing, how much times this is shared, how many people are talking about it because conversations today are largely inspired by social media posts. Have you seen this? Have you heard that? You know, mainly it's happening from our phones. Hashtags also can produce good results. So if you have an idea and you're trying to build along a storyline, you can put in a hashtag for that idea and see what people are talking about, how people are talking about those ideas to actually give you extra development along those storylines. Um, and, you know, you got to realize that you are dealing with real people, even if they're faking it, even if they're faking. I have some friends who uh, put up pictures that they in, in on the island relaxing when they had a break in the bottom of one basement. You know, but these are real people and they are putting out the life that they want to live. And those are still fodder to use. And even those situations where appearance versus reality, these are things that you can use just by looking at social media. And you can see how the concepts of idealization, nostalgia, romanticization, yearning, and trauma perform in real time with your potential audience. And that's important because you, you don't have to pay for this. It's free. It's a free way of actually building up your story and developing your storyline in a behemian context. Now, I know we're getting late. So this will be the last activity, I think. So what I want to do for whoever is interested is I would like to I would like to do this activity. We have a demographics of 25 to 35 year old Bahamian married professional woman from Nassau Bahamas. So if you can if you can find me a source of inspiration, whether it's a news story or a social media post, and then I want to know what's happening, what, what's happening that your demographic would actually care about it, what's happening in this news story, and then give me a bit of a log line about your inspired story from this news story, and then how will you leverage either idealization, nostalgia, romanticization, yearning, or trauma to lock in your niche audience. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just give you maybe about, maybe about seven minutes. So seven minutes, I should take us to nine o'clock, and then we'll, you'll just kind of hear back from uh, anybody who has done it, want to take a shot at it, and then we'll close out. All right? Um, Trevon, I have to leave soon, so can I give it a shot now? Okay, sure. Then I'll leave. Okay, so 25 to 35 year old, right? Mm -hmm. Um, source of inspiration. So I can think recently we had a I want to say 30 something year old Bahamian married professional woman who entered the Toastmasters competition, the world finals, mm -hmm. and she plays. I don't, I don't, I, I may get it wrong, but I know she placed in the top 10. Mm -hmm. So when I think about that story, it comes to mind that she's a married woman. She has children. 
Mm-hmm. So within that demographic, there's always the challenge and the tension with balancing it all and getting it all done. Mm-hmm. You have your work, you have your husband, you have your children, but you also have your goals, your dreams that you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So even though she is juggling all of these things, she still wants to achieve a goal of entering this competition um, and making it to the finals. Mm-hmm. That's that's what came to mind um, when I um, when I saw this 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 activity. So you now mean, the log you line... mentioned your 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 why the audience care about it is because people would still like to follow their dreams. Is that what you were saying? Yes, correct, mm-hmm. correct. Because women women always have the challenge of how do you balance it all? How do you I do like it that. all? How do you make mm-hmm. it work? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what about idealization, nostalgia, romanticization, yearning, or trauma that you can use to lock in that niche audience who wants to still pursue their dreams? Well, I think a part of it is is the 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 hope and and if if other you know married professional bohemian women can see themselves. Mm-hmm. In this, in this person, in this role, you know, that even though I may have two, three, four children, mm-hmm. even though I may be married, even though I may be working and, and, and very professional, I can still aim for something. Mm-hmm. Right. So That's I like I, yearning. I, yeah, I was thinking yearning because mm-hmm. I don't know if it's idealization, but I was thinking yearning. Mm-hmm. Because it could be, if you get to idealization, it could be whereas uh, maybe she was trying to, she feel like persons who win this maybe would be, uh, I guess, hired to do certain speeches, or maybe it'll take her further in life and maybe it, maybe it doesn't. Or maybe it's like when she's actually up there, she realizes, or not really in her situation, maybe even in another situation, if you use Mm -hmm. idealization, you're thinking, you know, it's not as good at the top as I thought it was going to be, you know? Right, right. But, um, okay. but so, yeah, yearning, yearning. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be yearning. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be yearning. Yeah. And maybe if, if you use nostalgia, maybe, maybe her dad may have done it before. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. That's, that's good. Anybody yeah. else want to take a shot? I mean, I don't have a post, Mm -hmm. but I know that it's, it's like things I see often, like, Mm -hmm. um, like when you see women traveling and like, oh, like I'm a boss, I'm a baddie, you know, the street life. Mm -hmm. I think that that might be, um, almost like, like in the story of a woman who is married. Mm-hmm. And she's a professional and she's with a spouse or a partner that doesn't necessarily feed her or they're growing, you know, like where you kind of grow apart, right. where you're growing at different paces. Mm-hmm. And so she sees the stuff like on social media and she starts to wonder if, you know, like, do I really like, do I, do I, do I do all this too soon? Or, you know, maybe I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so that's like kind of what I, I thought of, but where she mm-hmm. finds out that, like the streets are not all what it's cracked up to be. Ah, uh, so yeah, she, she she idealized being Odell. Yeah, you know, like you know, like how oh, there's this, there's this. Oh my gosh, there's this thing right now where people have two cards. That was like KFC or salmon, and then they pick that. And then like mm-hmm. rent a car or like you know, like they like they stuff that they make their partners pick out and whatever they pick, that's what they do. Oh. So like playing with that concept of um maybe wanting or wondering or or thinking that, you know, like we're working, we're doing this, but to what effort? Like what was yeah. like what's the point? you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's like where you discover that okay, yeah, that's we think that this is what we want, but what we have is actually even better because we don't see, we only see what social media tells us. Mm. 
That's that 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 that's a lot of potential. And there's a lot of so how do you lock in your niche audience with these concepts we were talking about? Um I would play, I would promote it the same way with that the two the two cards, like mm -hmm. single merit, like like play around mm -hmm. with it. I mean so so the so the two cards would be would it be more along the line of romanticization or nostalgia? Because I mean, it would be sometimes people could remember doing that, right? You do that, you have the cards, right? Yeah. So, yeah. With playing with that. Um, also playing with yearning for 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 women who who want that kind of um, like that kind of lifestyle, that marriage. It 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 plays into that yearning of like because I feel like we have a depiction of what married life of what weddings are, but not what marriage is. Mm -hmm. so I feel like it 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 will like the issues that the married couple faces, especially the younger ones, I feel like a lot of people get ooh, like or even young ones, like people my age right now, they mm -hmm. get married because, you know, we're told to get married. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, but I thought it was this. Mm -hmm. So I think that it brings that kind of um romanticism like you said mm -hmm. um it provides a yearning because this is what life it can be you know mm -hmm. based on the the concept of how it's done it's it's not an idea that you can't have mm -hmm. you know it's not something that is just a dream but it is something that you can you know it kind of gives a hopeful yearning like oh i can do this it'll be tough but i can do this with my spouse we can have this like how did i get married mm -hmm. like it had that kind of there were problems and stuff but they resolved it so it's like oh there's hope in tense marital situations mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if i'm making sense no you do you <laughs> are and i think along this storyline is important because you don't see a lot of films that talk about how married people or give value to marriages it's yeah. always something tearing up the marriage or you're trying to get married but when you see the married couple you know they they look like they're losing themselves they, they're not fun they got kids running all over their head it seems like they're always busy it doesn't seem like their life is so so you know big and glamorous, glamorous yeah. in, in movies but you know there are a lot of people there are a lot of situations where uh, you know a married life it gives us room actually to innovate along that end it gives us room to actually start to be thought pioneers in that area if if people are not doing it you know we can be the ones to start off showing how the strength of working together the strength of two two married people working together and um yeah they have conflict conflict is going to be there but they're, they're working together and yeah. uh, I think there's room for that and room for figuring out things and disillusionment is going to be there, but, but how do you move past that and how do you realize what you really have, you know? So I think that's a good shot. I think that is a good shot. Yeah. But I thank you all for, thank you all for tuning in and, um, and, and being so engaging and, and giving so much feedback. I really appreciate it. Uh, you all are friends, and I know you all are, are writers and directors who are who are setting the pace. So I'm hoping in 2024 we uh, can start to see some possible potential productions, and not productions limited by what you think you can find in terms of a budget. I think we start with the story. We get the stories down. We do what we need to do to connect to the audience and we 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 can find uh we can find the financing for a good story and i think we have to start there we have to start with the story but um i guess what i would do is reach out to the community because we wanted to discuss um planning out what bass's role would be in 2024 and also planning if we should have an event for the christmas uh, like a christmas mingle and trying to get a planning committee for that but we don't have enough persons to i don't know if we have enough persons to establish that but what we'll do is we'll reach out to persons and see if 
individually and see how we can organize something if we're going to organize something. But um, I thank you all so very much again for attending. And uh, just let me know if you want a copy of the presentation, I can send it to you. Um, I think everybody here is, uh, everybody here knows how to reach me. But um, I can send a copy of the presentation to you as well. All right. So we're closing out. Thank you so much for coming. And have a great night. Yes. Thank you. I would love a copy. Sorry. But good night to everyone. All right. I'll send you one. All right. Thank you.